If there was a reward for how you caught your wife cheating, then I suppose I would be in the top three, because I had to resort to some manipulations during which I exposed my wife. I was preparing for a trip with my wife, and I thought that everything was fine with us, but as usually happens in life, I found a turd at the most inopportune moment. My private investigator informed me that Steve was a creature of routine, so I decided to join the Thursday evening happy hour crowd at a stylish downtown bar in Charlotte, N.C., where Steve was known to frequent. I arrived at 5.15, anticipating that he would soon join his friends. I didn't feel anxious about the upcoming confrontation or the changes in my life that were about to unfold, as I had quickly come to terms with my new reality in less than a week. I must admit, a glass of Knob Creek bourbon had helped me ease into the situation. As the lounge area filled up around me, I had been gazing at the bar top when I caught sight of Steve in the long mirror behind the rows of liquor. He had joined his friends, and a tall beer had already been placed on the table in front of him. Steve is a tall and attractive man, appearing about a decade younger than my age of 52. Standing comfortably over six feet, he has a fit and athletic physique. With his blonde hair, blue eyes, and classic, well-defined features, it's clear why my wife, Lori, was attracted to him during her frequent business visits to the corporate office in Charlotte. My private investigator successfully gathered essential information. Steve had become a part of the company two years earlier, holding a director position in the marketing department, similar in rank to Lori's role in sales. They collaborated on various projects and frequently traveled together to visit customers. I didn't task the PI with extensive investigations, as Steve and Lori had already provided substantial evidence themselves. After finishing my drink, I ordered another and settled my tab. Walking across the lounge, I positioned myself next to their table, observing the five men and two women in Steve's group. Hi, Steve. I'm Chris Harrington, Lori's husband. I was hoping we could find a private spot to talk. Initially, Steve seemed puzzled. Although he displayed a smiling face, his eyes conveyed a sense of deep concern. Um, Chris, hey, nice to meet you. What brings you to Charlotte? I flew down to have a confidential conversation with you. Um, Chris, I'm here with friends. Can we possibly meet up another time? I surveyed the lounge, noting its rapid filling, and then gestured towards an unoccupied booth in the rear. I just need ten minutes. I'll take that booth. As I departed from Steve's table, I observed him down the last of his beer and order another. A few minutes later, he approached me with a concerned look. I can't fathom why you flew all the way to North Carolina just to talk to me. It would have been much simpler to call. I wanted to meet the man who's been having a sexual affair with my wife. My succinct and direct response deflated Steve before he could reply. Um, it's not what you think. I chuckled. It's exactly what I think. I managed to access the cloud-based server where you and Lori stored the videos. Now I have copies of all 16. Steve seemed even more taken aback. You have copies of them? Instead of answering, I inquired, How long has this been going on? I'm not sure. Exactly. About a year ago, four of us went on a trip to Allied Corp. In Cleveland. Lori's computer battery died, so I let her use mine. Somehow, she stumbled upon a fetish site that I frequently visit. Well, Steve, that just goes to show how clueless I was. I thought the affair lasted somewhere between six to eight months. Steve lowered his head. It didn't become physical for a while. Lori was intrigued, so we talked and emailed about it before. The unspoken details hung in the air. Both of us sat in silence collecting our thoughts. Chris, she loves you. You know that, right? I nodded in agreement. I love her too. That's why the divorce is going to be so difficult, Steve nearly shouted. Are you serious? You're going to divorce her over this? I deserve better than a dishonest, unfaithful... I sighed. I want to call her a slut, but I'm not sure if her actions qualify her as one, but they do qualify for a divorce. A heavy silence settled over the table for an unexpectedly long time until Steve finally asked, 
Chris, what are your plans for the videos? Well, I don't want to harm Lori. Suddenly, fatigue washed over me, and I only desired to exit the bar. Steve, I need to leave as I have an early morning flight home tomorrow. Lori departed for Philly this morning and will be back tomorrow afternoon. We'll have a conversation then. I locked eyes with Steve. Don't you dare utter a word to Lori, you despicable person. I'll find out if you do, and those videos will be shared with everyone in your life. I swiftly finished the remaining half-inch of knob, slammed the glass onto the table, and headed towards my hotel. As recent empty nesters, Lori and I had made a commitment to embark on two two-week vacations together annually. Our upcoming fall getaway was planned to begin in Vancouver, and we were eager to explore the Pacific coast, making our way south to San Francisco with stops in Seattle and Portland. On a Friday, I secured a rental car for our trip and arranged first-class flights to Vancouver and from San Francisco. While finalizing hotel reservations, I stumbled upon the initial signs of Lori's affair. Both Lori and I frequently traveled for work, utilizing accumulated airline miles, hotel points, and car rental rewards to offset vacation expenses. These rewards were among the few perks of business travel that helped ease our holiday costs. While we had always had enough points to cover our travel necessities in the past, I was taken aback when I realized we might need to pay for three or four nights at a Marriott for our upcoming vacation. It didn't add up. I estimated that Lori, like myself, spent around 120 nights away for business, enough to accumulate points for 12 Marriott hotel nights during our coastal drive. However, when I checked Lori's calendar, which we shared due to our frequent travels, I confirmed she had been away for only 72 nights in the previous year. Digging further, I logged into her Marriott Rewards account and discovered she had stayed at a Marriott property only 51 nights. A sense of unease gripped me as I questioned where Lori had spent the other 21 nights. By cross-referencing her calendar with the details from her Marriott Rewards Points account, I discovered that she had not made any hotel reservations during her visit to the corporate office in Charlotte. The knot in my stomach tightened, and for the first time in almost 28 years of marriage, I found myself questioning whether Lori might be having an affair. As a linear thinker, I was not one to shy away from confronting difficult situations. However, I wasn't prepared to continue my investigation at that moment. Instead, I informed my personal assistant of my plans and left my office. Anne, I need to head to the gym for an early workout. I changed into workout clothes in the company locker room, jogged two miles to the nearby gym, spent 45 minutes lifting weights, and then jogged back to the office. After a quick shower and change, I passed Anne on my way back to my office. Chris, you have several calls to return. Anne, something personal has come up. I need an hour or so to sort things out. Is that why you left for the gym so early? I nodded affirmatively, and she pressed further. Chris, is there anything I can do to help? As I walked past Anne and closed the door to my office, I couldn't help but shake my head, suspecting that she was taken aback by the depth of my sorrow. The tension resurfaced immediately as I settled at my desk. And when my phone rang just seconds later, my frustration reached its peak. Anne, I just mentioned that I needed an hour. I apologize, Jim needs to speak with you. He instructed me to interrupt you. Throughout my entire professional journey, Jim and I have been close friends and colleagues. As the company's president and the founder's son, he has been my guide, and I've climbed the corporate ranks to become his trusted associate serving as the Vice President of Sales and Marketing. I let out a sigh. I apologize for my earlier outburst, Anne. Please connect the call. Once I picked up, Jim inquired, Why aren't you taking calls? What's happening? I need an hour, Jim. Can we meet at 11.30? That won't work. I'm organizing a brief meeting regarding the Watson situation, and I need your input. I was infuriated and felt on the verge of exploding as I pleaded with him, Jim, just give me until 
I need to address a problem. There was a tense pause on the other end, followed by a cold agreement from Jim. I'll meet you at 11.30. With a knot in my stomach, I continued my investigation. Both of our companies utilized the same online expense report software, so I accessed Lori's account and scrutinized all her available trip expense reports spanning two years. The majority of Lori's travels were concentrated east of the Mississippi. Roughly one-third of her business trips were to the Charlotte headquarters, and the rest were to various other cities. Lori's expense reports indicated that all her travel expenses, including Marriott rooms, were charged to her corporate American Express card until eight months ago. After that, hotel charges were absent for all trips, except those to Charlotte. Upon revisiting the information, I found myself thinking, this can't be happening. It felt like my world was unraveling. However, a moment of clarity swiftly followed, providing a straightforward explanation. I chuckled in relief, admonishing myself for doubting my best friend, my wife. Numerous companies were cutting costs, implementing a strategy to regulate expenses for employee accommodations during trips to corporate headquarters. Some companies opted to pay hotels directly at a discounted rate, retaining the points for future employee visits. It occurred to me, this must be what happened to Lori's Marriott points. After contemplating for a few minutes, I accessed my computer's contacts file, searching for the individual from Lori's finance group. Among the 46 contact names from Lori's work functions, I eventually located the number for Sam Jennings, the director of finance. I dialed his number and left a voicemail. Sam, this is Chris Harrington, Lori's husband. We've crossed paths a couple of times at Excel's company events. I'm reaching out to various company finance professionals to gauge whether there's a trend of shifting policies to save costs by directly paying for hotel accommodations. Our finance team is considering this change, but I'm against it, as I believe our people should still benefit from hotel points. I would appreciate a call back. I left my office contact number and then proceeded to Jim's office for our scheduled meeting. As the meeting commenced, Jim gave me a puzzled look, but I simply shrugged in response. In just 20 minutes, the sales, marketing, finance, and operations teams reached a consensus on resolving a week-long issue with the Watson brothers, one of our long-standing clients. As the meeting concluded, Jim's tone became more serious. Stay back, Chris. Once the room cleared and the door closed, Jim inquired, What's happening? I sighed, and Jim allowed me a moment to collect my thoughts. My stress levels are through the roof, but just barely avoiding a heart attack. I'm dealing with some personal matters. Work-related or personal? It's not related to work. Is it about the kids? Feeling somewhat emotional at that point, I shook my head and took a moment before responding. It's about Lori. An hour ago, I was convinced she was having an affair. Now I feel foolish because I believe I've identified the issue. I'm waiting for a confirmation call. Jim had a smirk on his face and was shaking his head. You're being unreasonable. Lori is devoted to you and would never be unfaithful, so stop entertaining foolish thoughts and leave. Anne, who had looked concerned earlier, now had a smile on her face as she noticed me passing by her desk. Good to see you back to normal, Chris. After checking for urgent emails, I pressed the playback button to listen to my voicemail. Sam Jennings had returned my call. Hi, Chris. Glad to hear from you. We haven't seriously considered paying directly and keeping the rewards points. Yet. I researched it. And although it would save us around $5,000 annually, I've heard it could cost us up to 10 times that amount in lost employee goodwill. I agree with you. It's not a good idea. I hope this information helps. As Sam was finishing with, I hope this helps, my desktop picture of Lori was thrown across the room, shattering against the wall. While I packed my computer into my briefcase, Anne looked back and forth between the broken picture on the floor and me from my office doorway. Anne, I'm taking the rest of the day off. 
Only contact me if there's an emergency. If Lori calls, tell her I'm in a meeting and cannot be disturbed. I walked out without waiting for a response. It had been a challenging day at work. Starting my Friday morning when Chris headed to the office at 6.30, I felt justified in closing my home office down at 3.30 that afternoon and hitting the gym an hour earlier than usual. Feeling a bit mischievous and in the mood, I opted for the Stairmaster Stepper for my cardio workout, strategically positioning myself in front of three college frat boy types who were running on treadmills. Aware that these young men were visually appreciating my 51-year-old leotard-clad backside as I ascended the moving stairs, it provided me with a significant thrill. Contemplating the possibilities with these three college jocks, my mind started to wander into a daydream. There was no doubt that my intimate life was extraordinary. Chris and I were still engaging in physical intimacy three or four times a week, with me reaching climax two, and sometimes three, times each encounter. Oral activities played a significant role in our intimate moments. After Chris indulged in exploring my body, we often transitioned into a girl-on-top 69 position. I would slowly take in his impressive member while he skillfully explored from my sensitive clitoris to my snug anus with his tongue. I appreciated how he used his fingers to stimulate both my vagina and anus, creating a pleasurable experience. Typically, after disengaging from our 69, Chris would position me on my hands and knees, gripping my hips and engaging in penetration from behind. His length, particularly his girth, accompanied by my own touch on my sensitive area, consistently brought me to a state of orgasmic ecstasy. Occasionally, to add variety, he would lubricate my back entrance and insert himself into my anus instead of my vagina. He always began slowly to ensure my comfort, but once fully inside, he passionately thrust, satisfying my preferences. As he released his climax deep into my backside, I often stimulated my vagina, leading to explosive sensations. In addition, my thoughts drifted towards my upcoming trip to Charlotte. I had completed most of my preparations and anticipated a hectic schedule. Meetings were scheduled to commence only two hours after my arrival, and I would be working tirelessly until departing for home at noon on Friday. The only relief would be my evening spent with Steve. The majority of my workday would be occupied by meetings, including those with him, while my nights would be dedicated to his company in bed. I was aware that these upcoming nights would be delightfully indulgent. I was relieved to reach a point where I no longer felt guilty about my nearly year-long affair with Stevie. The activities we engaged in were quite explicit, and I couldn't involve my loving husband in the kind of depravity I experienced with Steve. It became my private indulgence, fulfilling a twisted sexual desire I hadn't known existed. Despite having a fulfilling life as a proud wife, mother, friend, and respected professional, being with Steve allowed me to explore a newfound primal need that was completely hidden from my normal life. The revelation of this perverse desire occurred unexpectedly during a business trip to Cleveland. Steve had booked a suite for us to collaborate on our work after business hours, preparing for upcoming meetings. After completing our preparations, Steve invited us to dinner, but I realized I needed an extra 30 minutes to finish some tasks for other clients. Since my laptop was running low on battery, Steve lent me his. I quickly completed the work and, not feeling particularly hungry, decided to check the delivery status of items being shipped to our home on Google. As I typed fee into the search box, expecting feetrix.com to appear, I was surprised to find a series of links leading to femdom websites. I was inexperienced and uncertain about the meaning of femdom, so I clicked on the first link. The videos were explicit, featuring women dominating and humiliating men. I was shocked that Steve watched that kind of porn. Initially, I was embarrassed, but after watching several clips, I found myself feeling aroused. I joined our group for a drink, but later excused myself. Excuse me, I'll be having room service deliver my dinner. I barely touched my food as I pulled up a series of femdom websites on my personal iPad, watching various clips. Soon, my blouse was open, and I was undressed from the waist down. I was stimulating myself while watching a mature woman instructing a young porn star to perform explicit acts. The actress lay on a couch with her legs spread, and the young man buried his face between her buttocks, following her commands. I was perplexed about why I found it so arousing. Chris was skilled at oral sex, even willing to explore my boundaries. While the sensations were always pleasurable, I doubted my husband, a typically masculine man, would tolerate the explicit language used by the woman in the video. 
I snapped out of my daydream and realized it was time to stop using the Stairmaster. With thoughts of the emails I had exchanged with Steve, the three boys staring at my bouncing buttocks, and the anticipated intimacy with Chris later that night, I felt a strong desire. I needed to hurry home to take care of myself and shower before dinner. As I entered the house on Friday night, it was almost 7.30, and Lori was clearly upset. Where on earth have you been? she demanded. I responded apologetically to my displeased wife. Sorry, I got caught up in a work issue and lost track of time. I sent you six texts and left three voicemails. Why couldn't you have at least responded? Once again, I expressed remorse. I forgot to turn my phone back on. I just wanted to leave the office and come home. Lori began to calm down a bit. I've already eaten, but your dinner is probably overcooked. It won't be very appetizing. I nonchalantly shrugged. No worries. I'll grab some Chinese on my way back in a few minutes. As I left, Lori seemed like she wanted to say something, but I couldn't catch her words before the door closed. Upon my return, I had a meal in my home office and tackled some tasks that had accumulated in the afternoon. However, my primary focus was waiting for Lori to retire for the night. At 9.30, she appeared in the doorway of the office. Are you planning to join me in bed soon? No. I need to resolve this issue first. I'm not certain how long it will take. Although I sensed Lori had more to express, she simply sighed. Good night. After giving it an hour to ensure Lori was asleep, I entered her office and retrieved her laptop. Before transferring it to my office, I inspected the notebook in the top center drawer of Lori's desk. Her workplace mandated monthly password changes for accessing their VPN, email system, and various other business software applications. To avoid forgetting, Lori logged each new password in the notebook and couldn't reuse the same one for a year. It took me no more than 30 minutes to locate what I was searching for. The emails were stored in a folder labeled Steve Miller. The emails of greatest interest were intermingled with business-related correspondence. As I delved into several months of private emails, I was shocked by the depths of Steve's and Lori's moral decay and perversion. Their explicit descriptions covered over 19 nights of debauchery in their sexually charged emails, and each new revelation felt like another knife twisting in my gut. Two months ago, Steve sent an email containing a URL that he had created. The email informed Lori that all their videos were stored on a secure, undisclosed website and were protected by a password which Steve provided. Upon accessing the site, I anticipated a certain outcome due to the consistently disturbing details in their previous emails. To my surprise, my expectations were incorrect. Witnessing my wife as the co-star in each video was a nightmarish experience, yet it provided undeniable evidence of her reprehensible behavior. When I glanced at the clock and noticed it was 15 minutes before midnight, I marveled at the chaotic turn my life had taken in the 15 hours since I attempted to make hotel reservations for our upcoming trip. What a dismal weekend. On Saturday, while I began my day tackling errands around town, Chris stuck to his usual weekly yard work routine. Although we could easily have hired a lawn service, Chris took pride in personally maintaining our yard. Our usual late lunch was delayed as Chris kept finding new projects to occupy his time in the yard. I was taken aback when Lowe's delivered some supplies later in the day, and right after their departure, Butler's Nursery arrived with three new apple trees. Chris, what's going on here? We've discussed adding more apple trees to the backyard. I also want to triple my hops yield and introduce two new varieties for my India Pale Ales. When do you plan to complete all of this? I'm digging the holes for the trees today and planting them first thing in the morning. Tomorrow afternoon, I'll construct the trellises for the hops and plant them while you're away next week. I felt frustrated. Are you going to spend any quality time with your wife this weekend? I'll be away most of next week. You haven't suggested any plans, so I thought you wanted to save your energy for your trip. I was taken aback by Chris's response, and for a moment, a twinge of guilt washed over me. 
However, reassured that my secret about Charlotte was secure, I replied, I'm arranging dinner reservations. Please be prepared to leave at 6.30. An hour before our planned departure, I grew concerned when Chris entered the house complaining of a backache. Chris, is there anything I can do? No, just cancel the reservations. Let's have pizza instead. Eager to please my husband, I followed his request. I ordered a pizza and picked it up, along with an India Pale Ale from a local brewery, one of his favorite beers. Upon my return with the pizza and beer, I couldn't believe what I discovered. Chris was already in bed. Fast asleep. Sunday turned out to be just as challenging. I had anticipated enjoying some of Chris's renowned morning delight, but he had risen early, an hour before I woke up, and was already engrossed in his outdoor projects by the time I emerged from bed. I spent the entire day grumbling, but he persisted in his work, which was incredibly frustrating. Chris continued his efforts in the backyard until nearly 7.30 in the evening, then hastily put together a tuna salad sandwich before falling asleep just 45 minutes later. Ugh, Monday morning brought frustration once again. As soon as our alarm went off, I turned to find Chris, only to discover that the bed was empty. I hastily got out of bed, threw on my robe, and went on a search for Chris, but he was nowhere to be found. My confusion grew when he finally replied to my text almost 20 minutes later. Chris. I'm at work. Concerned that Chris might be upset with me, I racked my brain for any wrongdoing on my part. I also pondered the unusual absence of intimacy over the weekend. It was unprecedented for us not to engage in sexual activity at least twice during the course of a weekend. In an attempt to reignite the passion, I initiated Operation Spice Up Our Love Life with a suggestive text. Lori, I can't wait for some intimate moments tonight. An hour passed with no response, prompting me to send another text. Lori, afterward, you can choose between my pussy or my tight little asshole. By mid-afternoon, my frustration escalated as I couldn't comprehend why he remained unresponsive. We had often enjoyed some of our best moments after engaging in dirty texting during the workday. I made one last attempt. Lori, how about dining on me for dinner? His unexpected reply caught me off guard. Sorry, I'll be working late tonight. I attempted to reach him three times within the next 30 minutes, but his voicemail greeted me each time. As a last resort, I sent another text to Chris. Lori, I'm embarking on a four-day trip tomorrow morning. I anticipate your return by six o'clock at the latest. My emotions were in disarray. I knew I'd still be upset about the treatment I'd endured in the past few days, making it unlikely for us to engage intimately once Chris returned. To vent my frustrations, I decided to direct them toward Steve by sending him detailed instructions via email. I was confident that my words would excite him, making our upcoming week together the most enjoyable yet. As the clock passed 6.30 without any communication from Chris, no calls, texts, or responses to my inquiries, I thought, forget him. After dining alone, I completed my packing for the week and loaded my briefcase and suitcase into the car. Fuming with anger, I turned on the TV and with each passing sitcom, my irritation intensified. Eventually, I decided to retire for the night. Chris would receive a chilly and emotionless response from me the following morning. I was relieved to find Lori asleep when I got home. I wasn't concerned about facing her anger. In fact, I was anticipating not only confronting it, but also completely overcoming and dismantling her in the days ahead. It had been an exceptionally long day at the office. I had arrived early and stayed late, determined not to fall behind in my work, despite a two-hour meeting with my newly hired divorce attorney, Vanessa. She provided me with a comprehensive list of tasks to complete while Lori was away. Although we had discussed the possibility of hiring a private detective, we ultimately decided that the explicit videos I had copied would serve as sufficient ammunition. I quietly slipped into bed, suspecting it might be the last time, with my estranged wife, who I referred to as a whore, and quickly drifted off to sleep. Due to my innate sensitivity as a light sleeper, I woke up 90 minutes ahead of our scheduled alarm on Tuesday morning. I quickly went through my morning routine, showered, got dressed, and headed to work. 
Despite feeling emotional during the drive, Lori's first text brought a smile to my face, evident by the steam emanating from my phone. Lori, I'm unsure why you're treating me this way, but it's unbearable. You didn't join me for dinner as I requested, neglected to wake me when you came to bed, and left without a farewell kiss. Considering I'll be away for four days, we must have a thorough conversation when I return on Friday evening. An hour later. Lori. At the very least, I anticipated an apology and a wish for a good week. What's going on with you, Chris? In the midst of work-related meetings, customer calls, and emails, I found myself managing the preliminary tasks associated with our impending divorce. I compiled a list of our shared accounts to settle and cancel credit cards and other debts on Thursday. Whatever remained would be divided between us. Since the house was in my name before meeting Lori, I retained ownership. Besides a modest second mortgage, the house was solely mine. I enlisted the services of movers to assist me in clearing Lori's personal belongings. The plan was to deliver everything to her parents' garage on Thursday. The house locks were changed and adjustments were made to my insurance policies, designating my children as beneficiaries. Additionally, my will and other legal documents were being updated to exclude Lori. On a pleasant Tuesday evening, I dedicated my time to planting hops in my backyard garden. It would take approximately two years for the plants to mature and start bearing fruit. After a late dinner, I retired to bed and fell asleep by 9.30. Upon waking up early on Wednesday morning, I powered on my phone and discovered a string of messages from Lori sent the night before. Lori. Last night marked the first occasion since we met when you didn't call while I was traveling. Please reach out to me. This can't continue. We need to have a conversation. An additional message arrived an hour later. Lori. I'm pleading with you. Please give me a call. And lastly. Lori. Don't shut me out. Please explain what's happening. I love you. I love you. I pondered to myself. If she wants to know, I suppose it's time to share with her. Me. The issue lies with Steve Miller. While reading the statement, Steve Miller is what's wrong, I experienced a moment of anxiety. However, that feeling quickly subsided, as I realized Chris couldn't possibly be aware of the true extent of my affair. Due to Chris's peculiar behavior over the weekend, I opted for caution and booked a room at the Marriott in Charlotte. Despite being eager for the emotional relief that only Steve could provide, I understood it wasn't worth risking my marriage. I decided to postpone any further escapades until my upcoming trip to our headquarters next month. I called Chris's cell and was pleasantly surprised when he answered. Good morning, Chris. I'm confused. How does Steve relate to the way you've been treating me poorly? Chris's response sounded fatigued and possibly irritated. If you can't grasp that your connection with Steve is entirely inappropriate, I don't know how to explain it to you. Inappropriate? Chris, Steve is a colleague. We communicate with each other multiple times most days. I'm aware of that. Chris chose not to continue, prompting me to step in. If you're referring to our dinners together, it's going to upset me. I understand that you have business dinners with women frequently, but it has never bothered me before. I've never been worried about your dinners with Steve or anyone else. Then why did you mention Steve as the cause of your behavior? My behavior changed when I learned about your involvement with Steve. My involvement? Are you out of your mind? I've never had any involvement with Steve or anyone else. Are you saying you've never been intimate with Steve? For heaven's sake, that's exactly what I'm saying. I've never been unfaithful to you, honey. I heard Chris sob, intensifying the ache in my heart and plead. Promise me, Lori. Promise me you've never had any involvement with Steve. Of course, I promise. I swear, I've never, never had any intimate relationship with Steve Miller or anyone else. The phone line fell silent. Chris, are we okay? It took a moment for him to respond. Yes, Lori, we're okay. I have to go because of an early meeting. Let's talk tonight and put this past week behind us. I love you, Chris. Have a great day. Chris signed off with his usual, I love you too. As I hung up the phone, I was sweating and my heart was pounding. 
I couldn't fathom why Chris would suspect me of having an affair. My only assumption was that someone from work might have perceived Steve and me as too close or having too many dinners together, possibly informing Chris. Recognizing that I narrowly avoided a crisis, I pledged to limit my after-work time with Steve. I decided never to spend the night at his place again and to restrict myself to one dinner with him every other visit. Within moments of Lori ending the call, where she continuously fed me untruths, I swiftly accessed the cloud-based platform storing their videos. I selected my top three favorite clips of their activities. In just five minutes post-call, these video clips were shared on Lori's Facebook page, accompanied by a change in her password. The initial video showcased Lori adorned in a leather bodysuit with strategic cutouts for her breasts, genitalia, and buttocks. Steve, in a state of nudity, had his hands restrained behind his back, kneeling on a hardwood floor with his head on the ground and his buttocks raised. The footage captured Lori verbally berating Steve, using derogatory language while administering a beating with a crop. Toward the conclusion of the brief clip, visible welts began to appear on Stevie's buttocks. The second video depicted the unclothed pair engaging in an unconventional doggy-style encounter. Lori wore a strap-on dildo, and Steve assumed a hands-and-knees position as she delivered penetrating remarks while engaging in the act. Do you like it when my solid, weighty instrument penetrates you? The third video, my favorite, was recorded in his backyard patio. Steve was unclothed, lying on his back, while Lori stood over him, straddling his prone body. I couldn't believe it when my wife let out a stream of urine that splashed onto his face, repeatedly instructing him, Drink my yellow liquid, you worthless person. I couldn't help but wonder how many of Lori's 1,080 Facebook friends would witness her behavior. I exited my hotel room and encountered my coworker in the hotel lobby, realizing that my conversation with Chris had caused me to fall behind schedule. Mallory, typically known for being prim and proper, was a friend of mine. I was taken aback when she inquired, What the heck is happening? Puzzled, I replied, What do you mean? She exclaimed, Your Facebook page, those dreadful repulsive videos with you and Steve. Perplexed, I questioned, Mallory, what are you talking about? Mallory stared at me for an uncomfortable period before insisting, Come with me, Lori, right now. Mallory practically pulled me to a secluded corner of the hotel lobby, pulled out her laptop and turned it on. She entered a few commands, and as I looked, I realized she was on my Facebook page. Mallory selected a video I didn't recognize, and in the next few seconds, my world fell apart. In under 10 minutes from sharing the three video clips on Lori's Facebook page, my son, Matthew, was the first to call. I picked up the call, saying, Hey, bud. Matt cautiously responded, Um, Dad? Something strange is happening on Mom's Facebook account. I tried calling her, but it went straight to voicemail. Um, I interjected. I know, Matt. I have Mom's passwords, and I posted the videos. Oh, crap, Dad. That's harsh. I expect Mom will delete the posts quickly. It's going to be challenging. What do you mean, Dad? After posting the videos, I changed Mom's password. She can't access her page. You're going to divorce a her, aren't you, Dad? I gave her a last chance to tell me the truth a short time ago, but she lied. So yes, I'll be filing for a divorce. Can I ask you for a couple of favors? Sure, Dad, I guess. Call your sister. Suggest that she doesn't watch the videos, but let her know what's happening. And give Mom a call. She'll need some support. I'll do that, Dad. A few moments later. What a mess. I love you, Dad. Just before noon, I had an unexpected visitor at work. I met Joe, Lori's dad, in the reception area and led him back to my office. This is a hell of a mess, Chris. I chuckled. Those were almost the exact words Matt used. Oh my goodness. Matt watched those videos. Joe seemed almost stunned as he continued. It's bad enough that her mother and I saw them. But her kids? There was a brief silence. I'm not very savvy with Facebook, but Lori told her mom that she can't access her account, so she can't remove the videos. 
Apparently, her password got changed. He looked at me with pleading eyes. Chris, it would mean a lot if you could take those videos down from Facebook. I had always liked Joe, considering both my in-laws as friends, so I went to Lori's page and deleted the three files from Facebook within a few moments. After finishing, I looked up at Joe. Could Lori stay with you when she comes back? I know we'll have to talk but I'm still processing and need some time. Joe nodded in agreement before I had finished. Of course. It might be for the best, actually. After a pause, he asked, Do you have any... any... longer-term plans? Yes, Joe, I do, and I think you know me well enough to understand what needs to be done. Tears welled up in Joe's eyes as he confessed. Yeah, I'd divorce her too. What a mess. Our meeting took place on a Saturday afternoon, two weeks after Lori's return. During our one phone conversation, she pleaded with me. Please, Chris, let's meet and talk. We will, but I need some time alone. Despite my request for space, Lori continued to urge me to talk through numerous phone calls, emails, and texts. She even involved our kids, families, and friends. Eventually, in the middle of the second week, I reached out to her via text. Me. Meet me on the backyard patio at noon on Saturday for a conversation. In response, Lori flooded me with messages expressing gratitude for the meeting and affirming her love for me, expressing a desire to mend our relationship. I skimmed through each message but refrained from replying. Before Lori arrived on Saturday, I visited Bernie's Deli and picked up a cob salad for her and a turkey club for myself. Although I considered getting a six-pack for me and a bottle of wine for Lori, I decided against it, thinking alcohol wouldn't contribute positively to our discussion. Lime seltzer seemed like a suitable alternative. I arranged the lunch on our backyard patio table and waited for Lori. At noon, I heard the doorbell ring but I stayed seated. After the third ring, I spotted Lori approaching from around the corner of the garage. As she walked towards me, she spoke her first words while standing with her hands on her hips. The least you could do is welcome me at the front door. The least you could do is not be a lying, cheating whore. Admittedly, my response was a bit harsh, but I believed it was warranted and continued. We can either continue exchanging insults or have a meaningful conversation. I motioned towards the spot on the table where her salad was set. After Lori took a seat, an uneasy silence settled in as we collected our thoughts. Chris, I've been trying to find the right words to make amends, but I'm at a loss. I need your guidance. Surprisingly, Lori, I've been grappling with the same dilemma. I've concluded that there's nothing you can say. But Chris, Think about our family. It'll be torn apart. Don't lay this on me, Lori. You should have considered that before you started engaging in questionable behavior. I didn't ask for this, and I don't deserve it. I'm just trying to clean up the mess you created. I know it's a cliche, but it was never about love. It was just, I don't know what it was. I'm so ashamed. Lori and I finalized our divorce after eight months. We still cross paths occasionally during gatherings at the kids' homes, maintaining a friendly relationship. While I suspect Lori may still have lingering feelings, a reconciliation is not on the table. Whenever I sense a connection with Lori, I vividly recall the video of her in a compromising situation with Steve at his dining room table. The memory of her explicit demands, such as using his tongue as toilet paper to clean her intimate area, quickly extinguishes any potential romantic feelings. In short, moving on from that incident is not something I can easily do. That's the end of the story. Write your opinion in the comments about this story. It will be interesting for us to read it. Also, do not forget to like and subscribe to our channel so as not to miss new, equally interesting and exciting stories. Good luck!